Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. To another session of case-based uh, prostate MRI learning. Um, I'm really thrilled with the international guest that we've uh, got for you uh, today slash tonight, depending on where you are in the world. So uh, I'd like to introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Professor Caroline Moore from UCL in London. Welcome, Caroline, and thank you very much for taking time out of your holiday to join us today. Thank you. It's good to be with um, Caroline uh, doesn't really need much introduction. I'm sure she'll be familiar to many of you attending tonight. Um, she's a world expert in prostate MRI and was the senior author on the uh, very influential precision study uh, published in the New England Journal. So thanks, Caroline, for joining us. We also have uh, Satoru Takahashi, professor uh, and head of the Imaging uh, Research Center in Takatsuki Hospital in Osaka. Uh, welcome, Satoru. Yeah, thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. And, and Satori, you also trained under one of the grandfathers of prostate MRI, Yella Berentz, many years ago. Uh, yeah, a long time ago, but I learned for a lot from the prostate MRI and also the MR lymphography from him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you were in Nijmegen in Netherlands for a little while. Yes, for three years, uh, about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Terrific. Well, thank you for joining us. I'm looking forward to, to hearing your input on the cases that we're going to look at tonight. And so now, Shoji, uh, urologist and associate professor in uh, Tokai University Hospital in Tokyo. Um, so now has special expertise and interest in prostate MRI and focal therapy. And we're going to touch on some of that uh, in this session as well. So, so now, welcome and thank you also for joining us. Thank you very much, Professor Jeremy. It is my great honor uh, to join the meeting. Thank you. That's a pleasure. And uh, we have our usual uh, local experts, um, Richard O'Sullivan, uh, who is an expert in prostate MRI, radiologist and associate professor here um, in Melbourne, who works at Bridge Road Imaging uh, as the head of MRI there. Uh, Richard, thanks for joining us again. Good evening. Hope you all enjoyed tonight. Now, you won't be seeing Richard's face because he's be going to be focusing on the imaging and bringing that up. And then Andrew Ryan, uh, is our uh, uropathologist expert who works for Tissue Path, a uh, local pathology uh, company as well, who you will see um, in a few moments, uh, the sort of uh, quality uh, pathology reporting that they provide. And in particular, extremely helpful in, in providing feedback for our um, prostate MRI uh, imaging and uh, enabling us to learn. So we'll, we'll see some of that in just a moment. So thanks everybody for uh, joining. Just before we start with the cases. Um, uh, this uh, webinar is being brought to you by MRI Pro um, and we're recording it and for any of your colleagues who happen to miss this live session we're going to pop it on the site so it's freely available um, down the track. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen so that you can see uh, what that looks like in a very super short video uh, which I'll play now. Review prostate MR cases online. Answer each case according to our structured pro forma answer page. And then get immediate feedback against the radical prostatectomy. 300 cases, track your progress, earn CME points, visit mripro.io. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to uh, obviously show you that. And also just to let you know that MRI Pro is also uh, now offering a much shorter version uh, called MRI Sprint, uh, which is 30 cases. And again, they've all got the sort of pathology uh, verification that we're going to see with the cases we're going to discuss tonight. Okay. Um, before we start the cases, just a reminder to everyone who's uh, tuning in that uh, you're very welcome to use the uh, Q&A or chat functions and uh, fire in some questions to our expert panel. Uh, we will attempt to answer them along the way and try and make it as interactive as possible. Okay, so uh, Richard, if, you, if you'd like to get stuck into the first case, uh, or at least start to get the imaging up, I'll, I'll start to um, go through the actual clinical background. So just the, this first case, just before we uh, actually start describing the MRI, um, 
This is a 61 year old man who has come in with an elevated PSA of 5.1. Uh, we repeated the PSA as we typically do, uh, and it came back actually slightly lower at 4.5, with a, and we also do a free to total ratio uh, of uh, PSA, and that came back at 20%, which was equivocal. Uh, interestingly, this particular patient uh, also had a so-called prostate health index, and we can perhaps talk about that later, uh, that was slightly elevated at 57. So based on two PSAs being elevated, uh, the next test as per guidelines, was to order a multi-parametric MRI. Richard. Okay, so this is just how I lay it out. That is, um, we do three. We use. Um, we do not use an endorectal coil. Uh, everything's done at three T MRI. Uh, we do three plane T two A images in the sagittal, axial, and coronal plane, and we do axial uh, diffusion imaging with ADC and a high B value of fourteen hundred in the axial plane and also in the sagittal plane. We also give all patients contrast, and this is a color DCE of wash-in on the top picture. Uh, and that's, uh, we also look at the subtracted images, uh, which comes directly off the scanner uh, in the pictures here, and you see on the bottom uh, left-hand corner. So this is a small volume prostate, 35 cc. If we just look at the axial T2 images, uh, the transition zone is here with a well-defined margin. It's got lots of areas of heterogeneous signal abnormality, hopefully with well-defined margins. And the peripheral zone is here where most of the cancers are. You'll see on this patient, there's a lot of decreased signal intensity in the peripheral zone bilaterally, more on the right than the left. Uh, and there's just one other thing I'll notice on a normal anatomy, this here is the central zone. It's like an upside down banana. It's, a very, it's an area of decreased signal intensity. The major importance from an imaging point of view is it does demonstrate restricted diffusion. So it's not to be confused with cancer. If we look at it on the sagittal plane, we can see central zone is here adjacent to the seminal vesicle. So as I've said before, we look at the uh, axial T2 edge, we can see that it is, there's nothing to see on the, in the transition zone, but there is decreasing intensity throughout the peripheral zone, more marked on the right than the left. If we go to the, um, I put the three images together, just bear with me for a while. When, when, Richard, while you're getting that set up, when you say you put the three images together, do you, at the moment, you've got the DCE? Oh, there you go. Okay, so these are the three series that you put up together routinely. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I look, I look at the, um, uh, the first thing I look at is the high B value diffusion rate imaging, to be perfectly honest, because that's where most of the information is. And you'll see here on this patient, this is the actual T2 on the left-hand side, the ADC in the middle and the high B value on the right. And you can see this area of decreasing intensity on the right peripheral zone demonstrates decreasing intensity on ADC and increasing in signal intensity on high B value. So as we go from the base towards the apex, you can see extending from the mid prostate all the way to the apex, you can see this focal restricted diffusion with increased intensity on high B value diffusion imaging in the posterior medial and postlateral peripheral zone on the right. Uh, Richard, it's also before you go on, I'd just like to, I'd, I'd be fascinating to know what uh, Satoru, how, how he hangs his prostate MRIs. Would you, would you look at those th same series, Satoru, or, or do something yes. different? Yes, uh, we rarely make a uh, diffusion weight image with a uh, sagittal image. We always use uh, transaxial images. So I'm so uh, so impressed to see a very nice sagittal diffusion weight image, which is quite unique for us. Do you, do you want to comment on that called... sagittal aspect, Richard? Because that's something that you're a big fan of, isn't it? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a big believer. that The thing about MR in general is we very it's very rare for us to get contiguous thin section images without a gap. So these images, uh, most of the diffusion imaging are between a, th a three, a three point five or a four millimeter slice, with about a half a millimeter slice difference, and we're dealing with a round object. So consequently, we don't really evaluate the base or the apex very well. So if we look at that perpendicular to that, we get much better information about what's going on, particularly the apex, which is quite a common area for. MR to uh, miss a lesion. So I find them very useful for that reason. You get two, two looks and the diffusion is by far the most important sequence.
And Caroline, as a urologist, what about you? When you get up a patient's MRI on your screen, which series do you tend to focus on? Are you the same or do you do something slightly different? Uh, so, yeah, if I'm in clinic, then I'll look at um, the high B value. So we either do a B1400 on our 1.5T or a B2000 on our 3T. Um, and then I'll look at the T2 axial and then I'll look at the contrast enhancement especially if it's post radiotherapy but even um yeah even in the primaries i'll be looking at the sort of raw images of the early contrast enhancement okay yep all right richard do you want to um keep going with this patient and just show so you can see this is the sagittal high b value diffusion imaging here and you can see it goes from the mid prostate to the apex again still high signal intensity on high b value if we look at the this is a an overlay image of t2 with uh, the DCE on a washout phase, and you can see that area homogeneously enhances with contrast. I actually find the subtracted images more useful. These are the original subtracted images, and you can see uh, that it, it goes from the mid prostate to the apex, homogeneously enhancement. And we're not all, we're not fantastic at extra capsule extension, but this lesion uh, this uh, lesion extends over two and a half centimeters. It is contiguous with the capsule posteriorly and maybe the capsule a little bit irregularly. I'd be suspicious of possible minor early extra capsular extension at that site. There's also a second lesion in the transition zone anteriorly on the right. And really what we're seeing that as uh, is an area of asymmetric restricted diffusion over uh, 1.1 centimetres. There is no real correlate for that on the T2A imaging. And if we look at the sagittal diffusion, the, again, the high B value, uh, we can see that it is quite, it is quite bright on high B value diffusion imaging, and you can see it's dark on the ADC. So I think that's a higher ADS 4 lesion measuring 1.1 semis in the transition zone on the right without any extra capital extension. Okay. So you've got pyrids four anteriorly on the right and then posteriorly pyrids five with a bit of, ex well, extra capsule extension in addition to more yeah. than 15 mils. Okay, thank you. So on the strength of that, uh, I obviously went ahead to perform a prostate biopsy, um, which Andrew uh, has got the results of. So I'll let Andrew... Okay. I'll just uh, go. Yep, that's the way. Over that. You'll see what I've done here. See. So, and uh, am I are you seeing that now? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Good. So that's um, their targeted biopsies, presumably on the right hand side, although it isn't labelled there. But uh, for, that's got four plus three, grade group three, up to 17 millimetres with other bad features, including introductal carcinoma. Mm. So as you can see here, uh, I have been somewhat trigger happy with this target um, because there's plenty of cores there which. I no normally wouldn't do, but um, I can't really uh, explain why I did quite so many calls with that particular target. Um, but what I wanted to ask uh, Sanao and Caroline in terms of biopsy is, because I know there's a bit of, particularly in your institution, I think even Caroline, a bit of um, difference of opinion as to um, what uh, the right thing to do is in terms of target versus template or both. What's your practice, Caroline? Yeah, so I do entirely transperineal, and I've been transperineal for probably about ten years now. It's you know it's been a really long time. Um, for him, he's young. I would obviously uh, biopsy the targets, biopsy that right anterior thing, and I'd biopsy the left peripheral zone as well. Yeah. Um, partly because of considerations for focal, but you know we could get onto that later. But also our uh, radical surgeons like to know the pathology on the other side for nerve sparing. To my mind, if yep. you can't see it on MRI, then you're okay. But um, but yeah, that's, so that's what I would do. Yep, yep, agree. Um, what about you, Sunil? Yes, uh, so in my institution, MRI transfusion image guided transperineal biopsy and 12 course uh, transperineal systematic biopsy were performed for the patient who had the pilot's category uh, larger than and three patient that's a protocol uh, yes okay terrific so now this patient uh was in i mean it's interesting is i mean his psa was only 4.5 so it's only you know it's not particularly elevated but he's got a big uh pretty substantial and aggressive type of cancer there um 
And uh, so on the strength of that, we uh, went ahead and then did a uh, staging uh, investigation. And our standard really now is, is moved to PSMA PET um, for staging. So I'll just quickly show you uh, what that showed before we, before we move on from there. So just bear with me for a moment. Hopefully you can see that. So this is a uh, typical uh, PSMA PET uh, that we have been getting for several years now. Um, and you can see obviously all the usual uptake in the lacrimal uh, and salivary glands, as well as the, the kidneys, liver, spleen and gut and so forth. And then of course the radio tracer accumulating in the bladder, but you can also see, I hope, um, particularly on the right side of the prostate, obvious uptake uh, within the prostate gland itself. So this PSMA PET is showing a positive primary, which is also somewhat useful um, to know, but no evidence of metastatic disease. So uh, that was the information uh, that we got. I went ahead then and performed a radical prostatectomy and Andrew, you should have the results of that. I do, I do, I'll just bring that up. So uh, Jeremy alluded to this before, so this should just go to full screen in a sec. There we go. Um, uh, Jeremy alluded, are you seeing everything or are you just seeing the single case one slide? No, we're seeing what's coming next as well by the looks. Oh yeah, okay. So it is it's sharing the wrong thing. Maybe I'll go back because we probably just need to see, um, oops, yeah. press yeah. the wrong one. We'll get there. Um, I meant to go back to that. We'll go to this. Yeah, that's... Okay, I'll go back to sharing again. There we go. Um, so Jeremy spoke, this is how we present. We, we present a, a prose report and then we also give our surgeons this volumetric or pictorial representation of where, where cancers are. So I was just gonna very quickly before we um, moved on to this particular patient's results, show how we get to these um, so that there is some context to them. Um, I'll just move that off the screen. Uh, so radical here, we ink it and then cut it. And these are, um, we cut into transverse slice perpendicular to the prostatic urethra and lay the slices out. So you see this kind of appearance here, um, all those mid slices are laid out and then the apex and the base are serially parasagularly sliced as well. So this is kind of what we get. And then we um, cut these into quadrants because um, we don't do whole mounts. Um, I know some places do, but it tends to increase the, the time in which the, the slices have to fix. So we, we don't do whole mounts. What we end up with is these quadrants on a, on a slide and uh, that's the microscopic low power picture of one of those. Um, and we mark out the tumor and we mark out both uh, index tumor and other tumor foci, as well as marking onto those volumetric pictures, uh, extra prostatic extension, seminal vesicle involvement and, and um, positive surgical margins. So it's really a pictorial summary of what the, uh, what the pathology is. That's fantastic. And, and so in this particular case, Andrew, you've got pretty nice correlation between those, those two main lesions. Very nice. So this is, you know, like there's a, a, a lesion on the right, uh, posterior lateral that's really filling the the right posterior apex and extending all the way up into the um, upper part of the gland um, and extending onto the left hand side as well. Um, there's also other foci in the right and left uh, transition zone as well as the left peripheral zone and we'll see those in a sec because they become interesting in the context of what you've just been discussing um, yep. in regard to target versus uh, template. So it's a high grade tumour, including areas of um, similar to what we saw in the biopsy um, areas of pattern four, pattern three, as well as some introductal carcinoma that I've demonstrated there. Um, so four plus three uh, extra prostatic extension at the right posterior lateral as well as the left, extending onto the left and these other foci here. And as I said, I'll just point out that there was a focus on the left-hand side in that left peripheral zone of three plus four with tertiary pattern five, which interestingly wasn't evident on the MRI. The other thing of note here is that he did nodes and he had four of 28 nodes involved, all very small foci though, so, uh, you know, low, smaller than what you would expect to see um, on your MRI or on that PSMA. Yeah, so there's a few points to pick up there. I suppose um, in terms of doing template, um, you know, get, getting back to the discussion we were having about that, my usual practice would be that if, if I'm very confident that we're going to be taking the prostate out, then I'm not so uh, committed to doing template. Having said that, um, I totally agree with Caroline's comment about 
at least uh, having uh, perhaps some uh, tissue evidence that there's not uh, cancer that might prevent a nerve sparing on the contralateral side. Um, but if I'm considering focal, uh, then I will definitely do a template because I do want to get that extra uh, convincing um, that I'm not missing anything. And again, I know that some people um, are not so keen on that, but certainly the current guidelines would suggest that uh, targeted plus template's the way to go. Um, and secondly, you mentioned the lymph nodes uh, being positive, four out of 28, Andrew, um, neither seen on MRI or PSMA PET. Um, Richard, have you got a comment about when lymph nodes might become visible on an MRI? Um, MRI is broadly speaking equivalent to CT. That is to say, it's not very good. Yep. Uh, it's, uh, the lymph nodes have got to be of the order of a centimetre or so uh, for us to be confident that they're pathological. Anything below that it's guesswork on MRI, even if they diffusion restrict or not diffusion restrict, I don't think that really helps you. The, the cutoff of PSMA PET, I think, is about 0.3 uh, centimetres, so it's, it's much better, but still not perfect. So uh, if you have lymph nodes less than 0.3 centimetres, uh, which is at least probably are close there, aren't they, Andrew? Yeah, two, uh, uh, one, 1 1.5 and a couple of twos. Yeah, so they're, they're, I think they're below the imaging threshold for PET. Mm. So it sort of leads into a discussion about PSMA PET. I um, uh, don't avoid uh, lymph node dissection if the PET is not showing uh, avid nodes. Caroline, do you use PSMA PET and does it help you decide whether to do a lymph node dissection or? Yeah, so we do use PSMA PET. And actually, I don't know whether you just didn't show all the images, but we have PSMA PET CT or, or PET MRI. So okay. we get a kind of really detailed set of set of images. Um, and on the whole, if there's lymph nodes positive on that, they would be more likely to go for radiotherapy. Obviously, okay. you still get the occasional node that's positive anyway. Um, but on the whole, and for, for that chap, you, I mean, 65, if he's otherwise fit and well, we might have told him he might, he can choose to have his prostate out, but he's likely to need radiotherapy afterwards. So then they might not have um, sort of done the nodes. Okay, and if your pet was negative like this guy um, mm -hmm. for lymph nodes, would that would that alter whether you take lymph nodes at surgery if if he goes down the surgical path or not? Yeah, yeah, it would. Although he's reasonably, he was pretty high risk from his biopsy. He'd got a two centimeter tumor there. He'd got you know three different areas. So uh, mm -hmm. so he probably would have had his nodes done even though the pet was negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, so there'd okay. be some cases where if it was a bit lower risk based on other factors um, and the PSMA PET was negative, then you just do the prostatectomy without a node dissection? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, Satoru, are you using PSMA PET? No, unfortunately, no, we don't have the PSMA PET right now. So your staging is traditional bone scan and CT, is that right? Or uh, yes, and also the but regarding the lymphoid imaging, we always apply a uh, three-dimensional T1 weight imaging for four pelvis using MRI, because uh -huh. uh, we also do see the detail of the lymph node and also the shape of the lymph node clearly. So, so uh, I suppose that you, in your institution you do not have many special uh, imaging uh, MR imaging for the lymph node, we just say make a T2 weight imaging for the local process imaging. But in, in my institution, I, I always make a, a four pelvis imaging using a three dimensional T1 weight imaging. So because we can see the detail of the vessel and the location of a lymph node, and also we can sometimes detect the bone lesion. So I yes. prefer to make a volumetric. But, but uh, we do do a 3D T1 so-called oh, yeah, great. Yeah. I haven't showed that, but I, uh, which we can reconstruct any plane. So it's that's good for bone, uh, but uh, you yep. still get these small 0.57 lymph nodes, and you know where they are, but you don't know. No. Where they are. So now, so, have you got, have you got yeah. a PSMA PET in Tokyo? No. Um, recently in Japan, uh, four body DWI, visually weighted image for body, Dwebus, uh, has been very, very attractive in Japanese urological physicians. So uh, sometimes we used the modality for the detection of the metastasis. A full body uh, diffusion mode? Yes. Right. How long is a patient in the scanner for that? Uh, 
around not so long, about 30 minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. interesting. Do you ever use that as an option, Caroline? Or? Yeah, we do. So we've done a few studies of um, pets versus whole body. And I think it's a good option. And, and for the times when we don't, we sometimes have pet availability problems. And we had a pet funding problem maybe 18 months ago, which we've sort of got ourselves around by some way or other at the moment. But yeah, so a uh, whole body MR, if, it, if, if not, is, is an option. It just takes a long time to go through the sequences and... For me, one of the disadvantages, which I tell patients before I order it, is we often find a little something there. And that little something leads to another three CTs, and then people go, oh, it's fine. So I think that is more of a disadvantage than you get with PSMA PET. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's okay. a reasonable option. All right, well, just to round out this... Oh, I do, yeah. Mel Melbourne's a city of about 4 million people. And there'd be 30 PSMA PET scanners in Melbourne. Right. Yeah. But that gives you some idea about what the availability would be. Yeah, that's, that's we, we actually use it the other way around a bit because we call it PS, relative PSMA PET. That is to say, you'll see things like kidney cancers will take up PSMA PET, hemangiomas in the spine will take up PSMA PET. And so sometimes we use MR to solve those bony issues, particularly, as we used to say, metastasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Richard. Um, so just to round off this first case, um, this guy is now 18 months post-op. His PSA is 0 0.05, uh, remembering that he had those four positive, albeit small lymph nodes. So we'll have to watch this space, but I guess he is at risk of uh, potential micrometastatic disease that uh, at least if he does have it, it's a, a sort of a, a late and slow growing disease. So we'll see what happens with him. All right. Can I just say one other thing, sorry? Yep. You can see from Andrew, uh, Andrew's path and our radiology, what MR underestimates the extent of tumour uh, by at least 10% and probably more. Uh, it probably underestimates the degree of extra capsule extension because most of the, what we were looking at is the radial extra capsule extension, which is often of the order of a millimetre or two. So we, we underestimate that for sure. Yep, no, that's a good point. Well, that left side, I guess, that's the interesting part. That said, that was a three plus four with a reasonable pattern, a percentage pattern four, 40%, and a tertiary pattern five. So it's interesting that that wasn't seen. Yeah, the, the, the diffusion is abnormal on that side, but not, not as abnormal as what you've seen. So you can see here on the diffusion here, it does cross the midline, but not mm -hmm. nowhere near as extensive as what you've seen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, just a reminder to people tuning in, um, please feel free to uh, hit the Q&A button and uh, ask some questions along the way. All right, we'll get on to case two. Uh, Richard, while you're getting that up on screen, this is a young bloke, 49 years old, uh, with a PSA of 5.2 and a free to total ratio of just 8%. Uh, uh, and a, he also had a normal uh, midstream urine. Actually, Caroline, do you, do you routinely get a free to total PSA or just a total or...? No, just a total. So I suppose because we were sort of early to MR, we didn't, we, we don't use any of the other things apart from PSA density. So yeah. for us, PSA density will make the difference between a biopsying a three or not biopsying a three. Yep. Perfect. Oh, well, we're going to be talking about that with this particular case. So that's ideal. Okay. Um, so this patient had that elevated PSA and went on to have this MRI that Richard has hopefully got there. Case two. Can you see that? Yep. Okay, so again, small volume prostate. Uh, I've got a vision out of 20 cc. Um, it's not a lot to see on the, on the sagittal T2 imaging. On the axial T2s, you can see the peripheral zone is almost iso intense to the transition zone. It should be much brighter than the uh, peripheral zone. And I can't really see a focal lesion. Uh, if we go then to the uh, axial, uh, We'll perhaps we'll put the three of those together again like we did before. And I'll just link those. Uh, so as we go from the uh, base to the apex, uh, initially I looked at this and I thought that's rectal air artifact at the, uh, at the interface between the peripheral zone and the transition zone. But you can see there is some decreasing intensity on the ADC at that site. I've got that measured on our scanner about 900. Uh, but there's no equivalent on the actual T2 imaging. 
as we go further down, it's the only lesion we see. So if we look at this lesion, uh, and if we look then on the sagittal high B and correlate that, th there's no obvious lesion there. And then if we then go to the, uh, the DCE, you can see there's homogeneous enhancement throughout the peripheral zone. That's why the subtractions are so important because if we look at the subtracted image, particularly the early phase subtraction, if we correlate the two of those together, there's focal contrast enhancement at the location where there's increased intensity, signal intensity on the high B value, the fusion wave. So I've gone from being not sure about this lesion to being sure this is a pyrodes 4 lesion. Uh, measured, uh, I've got it measured on just on one centimeter in size. So, I mean, this is a really interesting case, I reckon, because, you know, the initial, as you were saying, Richard, you know, the initial report on this particular case was negative, and you were explaining why that is in terms of the potential for rectal gas artifact. And, and what really caused us all to go back and review it was what Caroline mentioned before, and that's this whole concept of PSA density. Um, because, you know, this guy is, he's only, first of all, he's only 49. And like I said before, his midstream urine was totally normal. So he doesn't have any evidence of any sort of inflammatory reason um, for his PSA being elevated. And that free to total ratio of 8% was particularly concerning. And the volume of this guy's prostate was only 15 cc's. So he's got a pretty high PSA density. Um, and when I think the main message that I wanted to get across with this case is that when that happens, if you've got a negative MRI, but your PSA density is pretty high, the, really the first step is to just go back over the images themselves, even before you make a decision about biopsy and just say, uh, have we really called this a negative or, or could we potentially have missed anything? Is that something, uh, what, do, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Caroline? Have you got any... Um, yeah, so I mean, I think for us, uh, we have a lot of debate about contrast imaging. I think here on the early contrast sequences, you can you can see some stuff there. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're very keen on it. I think there's also the question, um, not so much in this man, but of the bright young prostate. So yeah. the fact that he's 49, we take into account that it's often a bit harder to see stuff on the MRI. So with a negative MSU, he'd be getting a, he'd be getting a biopsy. Yeah either way and I would or I would um, be biopsying his peripheral zones even if I could see nothing but here as, as Richard said we can see something on the early contrast and the, the B1400 yeah. So that ISO intense um, sort of picture as well can be pretty challenging too can't it um, and I think that's that's an area where if you can't really see much difference all around the prostate because things are, are pretty similar you can really get uh, lost in that as well plus you've got uh, that other issue that Richard mentioned, which is this rectal gas. So, uh, Satori, when you um, do MRIs, do you do anything to try and minimise rectal gas? Do you use enemas or, or, or do you use a coil? What, what do you do? Well, in in our institution, we we don't use our uh, endorectal coil, but we always ask the patient to go to toilet before the examination. And yep. then uh, we check the rectum gas or rectum uh, stool, and then we start our examination. It's very important to reduce the uh, reduce the gas in the rectum. And that's Richard. That's been a change in your practice, hasn't it? Um, I think initially. Uh, yeah, so this this scan is about uh, three years old. Yeah. I suppose for the last couple of years, we get the patient come an hour early, and they all get a micro examiner, and uh, and then we scan them after they've been to the toilet. Yep. And so the rectal gas artifact is much, much, much improved. Yep. Yep. That's good. All right. So on the strength of this uh, uh, reviewed MRI with being Pyrads 4, I went ahead and did a transperineal biopsy, uh, which Andrew should have. So he's had template and the target, that right posterior peripheral zone target, and there's tumour in both the right posterior template and the target, um, three plus four, ranging from 10 to 40%, and uh, two and six millimetres in both those cores. Even that raises an interesting point. I mean, I've actually got a longer core of cancer, albeit with a smaller percentage pattern four, um, in the template than I did with the target. And I suppose that's yet another argument potentially for doing both. Um, a corollary to that, however, is, uh, and one thing that there's some evidence for is to ensure that when you do a target that you're not doing just one or two, that you're probably better off doing three or four cores um, per target. What, what do you think about that, Caroline? 
Uh, yeah, so definitely. So in precision, we think that's one of the reasons that we did show a good difference between the, the two sites because in other studies they've done two or possibly three, we did four in precision. And in fact, in clinical practice, I'll do four as a standard, yeah. but if it's difficult, if it's really anterior, really apical or whatever, I'll, I'll do more if I think I might not have got it. Yeah, I, I think that there's very little downside in really peppering, you know, where the money is, if you like, um, to get the best possible answer as to what's going on there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, based on that biopsy, uh, I went ahead and did a uh, radical prostatectomy. Andrew, you should have that. And so this is his volumetric picture. So I, this is flipped. That was the other explanation. We used to have our right on the right and left on the left. So this is flipped around. We've gone now to uh, present it more the way the MRI is shown. So, but that is why that's uh, that's in reverse because it was a couple of years old. So his lesion as seen on the MRI in that right posterior lateral, mid posterior lateral um, peripheral zone. Um, so you've got beautiful correlation there, haven't you? Really beautiful and and uh, organ confined, a couple of other little foci. So I'm just circling these uh, on the slide and he's got pattern three and pattern four. These areas of fused glands here. So his summary is that right um, apical to mid peripheral zone, three plus four, 30% organ confined and margins clear. So this begs the question, uh, Caroline and, and Sanal, uh, in retrospect, having seen <laughs> What this prostatectomy looks like now he's only 49 would you offer this man focal would you have yeah definitely because yeah. he's 49 unilateral disease three plus four so meets the criteria i very very rarely treat visible three plus three it's nicely visible apex looks good and i would i would tell him one in four chance of a second high food by five years uh, less than 1% urine leakage, two in three men keep natural erections. If you do need surgery, it can be more difficult. You should think about that because you're 49. But with all of that in the mix, if he wanted it, then yeah, I think he'd be a good candidate. So HIFU is your energy source of choice? So HIFU, I suppose, is the workhorse. So we've, uh, in terms of our published series, we've published over a thousand. We've probably done couple of thousand of primaries plus plus redos plus plus salvage and it's for that posterior tumor really sort of straightforward choice for us so i wouldn't use anything but high food for that one um other energy sources we've got we've got cryotherapy um in some settings we've got nano knife electroporation i do a bit of photodynamic therapy within a study a salvage study um yep. we've used all sorts over the years um yep. the corkscrew thing all sorts of <laughs> ways no. to you have He's done talking. run the gamut and what about focal brachytherapy is that uh, uh, available uh, with you guys or, or you've got something yeah, so it isn't but yeah that's a shame i think you know there's no reason he wouldn't be suitable our radiotherapists don't like the idea of focal brachy they say you don't know how much you're given to the other side whereas with hyphy you know that you're not treating the other side at all mm -hmm. um but i think he'd be a good candidate if somebody was offering that yeah and do you use any hydrogel for posterior lesions uh to um, spacer to uh, separate it away from off the rectum or anything like that no no we don't so because um with we've got well we've now got transrectal and transurethral high food but we mostly use transrectal so you're really sort of focusing the energy so you just compress the rectum um and get it out of the way in, in that way we did with an old photodynamic therapy study we were injecting a dye to see if that would help in fact they did that in toronto but it was um it wasn't particularly helpful and that was with a transperineal approach with photodynamic therapy. So okay. no, no doubt. So now your experience with focal therapy, what, what do you, you, you were nodding before saying that you would treat this guy with folk, would have treated him with focal. Um, what would you do? Yes, thank you very much. So uh, this patient has a good uh, candidate for the focal therapy and because and the low and the intermediate risk prostate cancer is a, a good treatment. Uh, uh, treatment of treatment uh, candidate for the focal therapy. In addition, for the patient, the uh, cancer region is very limited located. So HIFE um, is a good modality for the patient. Uh, in my opinion, the brachytherapy is a, a good uh, modality for the hemi ablation. So high ablation is a very good modality for the limited um, cancer patient. Yep. All right, well, we'll discuss that further on the next case. Um, are there any other comments that anyone would like to make about case two? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I have one comment to the technicians because uh, this area is very sensitive for the artifacts from the rectum gas. But when we change a one parameter, we can change the direction of the artifact. So we can reduce the uh, effect, uh, influence of the, the artifact to the prostate. So it's a very important to educate the technician uh, and my tech to right. when we find some artifact around the prostate, maybe uh, the, the technician should uh, repeat another scan with changing some parameters. So that's why it's very, very important to educate a technician. So are you saying that you, you would do that in real time? So you'd, you'd look at the, the technician, you'd look at the images coming through, notice that there's artifact and then you would change? Well, well, in many situations, uh, they can uh, do it by themselves because yep. I have already educated this is the artifact and when you find the artifact, please change this parameter and repeat the scan. Yep. This is my order to the technicians, yes. Yep. We have a Siemens 3T systems and yep. the conventional diffusion we use is a, a, far, is a great echo based, uh, echo planar diffusion wave imaging, which is mm -hmm. relatively sensitive to metal and to air. So when we have patients who have got hip replacements, for example, we use what Siemens calls Resolve, which is a spin echo based uh, yeah. mm -hmm. diffusion wave imaging which is less susceptible to rectal air and less susceptible to metal artifact, but it's not as good as the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. I agree. And All I right. just have a comment yep. about active surveillance for this chap. So um, if this chap asked about active surveillance, I'd say he's definitely gonna need treatment at some point. He's got visible tumor, it's three plus four, he's young. Yep. But if he had a compelling reason to defer treatment for a short while, Yep. then that would be a case that maybe at 49 he's completing his family, maybe he's just about to travel abroad for six months. Yep. So I would say he could, you know, defer for a short while, three monthly PSAs. If he gets to a year, he'll need another MRI as long as the PSA has been stable. But I yep. think it wouldn't be a long-term option for him. I, that, I reckon that's pretty cutting edge, Caroline. I, I think um, there'd be a lot, of, a lot of people who would struggle to get their heads around that. I know, um, you know, there's been... A sort of an argument that you know if there's any pattern four present that uh, uh, in a younger man that, that that's you know it's not an option but I think I think you do have to be a little bit more nuanced than that and if it's really low volume pattern four um, and you've got other significant reasons you, 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 your chances are you're gonna have unless you do focal if you're doing a radical then certainly you, you're gonna impact that guy's quality of life for sure so yeah I take yeah, it definitely and we, we've recently published a surveillance series of probably 600 MR surveillance guys. And I think probably 30% of them had pattern four. So, yep. you know, we're comfortable with it in the properly consented patient who will, you know, comply and not be gone for five years and then come back. But yeah. Yeah. All right, Richard, case three. Okay. So this is another uh, similar. Uh, style of case, but a fairly uh, older patient. This is a 72 year old man who was your sort of classic old style workup. Uh, this is several years ago when his PSA came in at five and the next step was a good old fashioned transrectal biopsy. No imaging, no transperineal and surprise, surprise, his biopsy was negative. Um, and then over the subsequent years, his PSA rose slowly and got up to eight. Um, and as a result, uh, when we had, when we then did have MRI available, uh, we got one. Okay, so this is a larger volume. Can you see that one? Yep. This is a larger volume prostate. I've got this measured 55 cc uh, with some moderate BPH here. So only minor linear decrease intensity in the peripheral zone. Uh, if we look uh, again, if we link the three of those. So if we look at the axial T2s in the transition zone, we can see here there's a focal area of homogeneous decreasing in intensity. This is different to the rest of the transition zone. And Chile on the right, which has got marked restricted diffusion, decreasing intensity on ADC, increasing intensity on high B value diffusion ranging, and really goes from the base to the apex. If we look at the uh, sagittal diffusion weight imaging, we can see how extensive this is. I've got this measured at 2.7 centimeters. So this is a pyrates 5 lesion. There is a bit of capsular bulge, but I think the, cap the capsule is intact at this site. Um, and uh, this is an older study, which we used a, a 
uh, K-trans or which is not really all that useful for looking at looking at uh, contrast enhancement. We've now changed to that washing I showed you earlier. Mm. So pyrads five lesion in the anterior transition zone. So Tori, any comments on on your viewing of the imaging? There is, do you agree that with what uh, you're hearing? Uh, yeah, it's. I completely agree with the the comments. Uh, this is a very typical case with a uh, uh, easily missed uh, without imaging. Typical yeah. case, yeah. A absolutely, and it's one of the points is that you know this is precisely the sort of lesion that uh, is classically missed on a on a transrectal biopsy coming in around the back. Um, so with that MRI in mind, we went ahead and did a, a transperineal biopsy. Uh, and just while you're getting that up, Andrew, that there are a couple of questions coming in, uh, which I'll address in just a moment, but we'll keep going with this case for now. So, so these are numbered biopsies rather than sites. So that, that was obviously needed to be deciphered, but we've got the right anterior as a, as a pyrads five. Um, so somewhere in there and it's a target biopsy as well. So I've got 11, 20 and 25 that have got tumour, but the target biopsy, this 25 is the one with, um, with the highest amount of tumour up to 10 millimetres. There is a tiny little focus of, uh, that's been graded as four plus four, but only one millimetre. So that should be taken kind of in that context. Yep, yep. and that was right anterior as well. So um, I know that that has to be decoded, but uh, it's mm -hmm. in the same area. Okay, yep, so that is what the biopsy showed. Um, what do you think about focal for this guy? Caroline? So I think he's a potential candidate. I'd tell him about that tiny bit of four plus four and say usually, you know, if it was a whole four plus four, then I would say no. But um, I would actually just like to see the, the apex and how far that lesion goes down to the apex. But as long as the, there was a reasonable margin there, then I think he'd be, um, he'd be potential for, for vocal. And for him, I'd use cryo, probably cryo over nano knife, but um, yeah, certainly needle based. In the olden days, we used to do um, a right hemi for that. And I really wouldn't do that now. If for some reason I didn't have cryo or nano available, I'd say he'd need radiotherapy or surgery at he's only 72. And but so why, why, have you gone, uh, why have you gone off the hemi? Uh, so it, transrectal hyphu just is not great at anterior tumours. So we, we, we used to use it occasionally, but nowadays we don't. We've got needle-based treatments and they're much better for the anterior tumours. Yep. Okay. So now, oh yeah, Rick, you want to tell us how far it goes down to the apex? So this is the saddle yes. region, which is probably the best way of looking at it, I think. And you can see it's well clear of the apex. Great. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. He'd be offered cryo or surgery or radiotherapy with us. How about you, Sanal? What, what would you do? So, uh, I agree with uh, Caroline. So, because uh, hype is not good for the mortality and uh, for the treatment uh, the, uh, in anterior side of the prostate in such a large prostate. So, transperineal approach treatment is more good, so such as cryotherapy or brachytherapy. Yeah, so so we've we've actually been doing some focal brachytherapy. We've we've started a, a prospective registry on focal, um, and it has really been very much targeted to the lesion with a with a margin of error around it. Um, and so this patient was one of the pilot uh, patients for that. Um, so we did a focal brachytherapy uh, to that lesion uh, with forty six seeds via thirteen needles, and. As part of the routine follow-up for these patients, we are getting an MRI and a repeat transperineal biopsy. Uh, we did actually start doing it at 12 months, but we're now doing that at 18 months post-treatment. Um, but this particular patient was still when we were doing it 12 months. So Richard, I think you've got the MRI of his post-focal therapy, focal brachytherapy. Um, so this is the actual T2A image. You can see these uh, black dots in the, in the prostate, predominantly in the, uh, the, uh, the seeds and the right half of the transition zone does cross the midline into the left half, not really present in the peripheral zone. Uh, if we look on the uh, actual, uh, this is the ADC, you see the seeds even more clearly, but there's no ongoing restricted diffusion. Uh, the actual high B shows no ongoing abnormality on the high B value diffusion imaging and the same on the Sagittal uh, diffusion imaging, no, no 
uh, increased signal intensity. The most important picture, I think, for post-treatment either change, either in the prostate or outside the prostate, is the DCE. Mm. And there's just homogeneous enhancement throughout the transition zone. There's no focal enhancement. And if I show you the uh, subtracted images, you can just see the same thing. It's just There's no focal abnormality on the transition zone. So mm. I would say no residual tumour based on the MRI. Okay, and, and regardless of the MRI, we, we always get a biopsy because this is a new treatment. We want to, you know, be sure that we've done the right thing. So uh, we've got a, a repeat transperineal biopsy and that, of course, must include both targeted plus template biopsies. So the templates are all negative. Um, the target biopsies from that right site um, did show some adenocarcinoma. Um, ungraded because of the treatment effect, um, still showed eight, eight, five, and two. Um, hard to know. Like these are these are difficult because I always it's akin to taking a photo of a car as it drives past. You don't know how fast it's going, where, which direction. You know, like you you might be able to work out which way direction the car's going, but um, you don't know whether it's a, a car that stopped and doing a reverse or um, otherwise. So, uh, you know, it's, there is tumor there, but it looks sick. Yep. So it's one of the reasons we pushed it out to 18 months um, for trying to minimise that sort of artefact. I mean, you can still get it, can't you, Andrew, even out to that time, but um, it's a matter yeah, of... Kind of, kind of isn't, no, I couldn't find a lot in... You know, this was one of our early experiences with, with biopsy so soon after radiotherapy. Um, and I couldn't see a lot in the literature about, you know, the stepwise progression, but certainly I could find that mm. it survives for an extended period of time. So we, we just uh, obviously continued the follow-up of this patient. I mean, his pre-op PSA, just to remind you, was eight. Um, he's, he's now four years post-treatment um, and his PSA uh, keeps going down. It's down to 0 0.4 now without any other uh, treatment from that. So despite the perhaps slight uncertainty about the actual pathology on that repeat biopsy, you know, with the PSA that low, we're, not, we're, we're very, very comfortable in just continuing to monitor. Any, any comments? Um, on, on that case, uh, Caroline? Uh, yeah, I think that, that really makes sense. We don't, um, we know there's a difficulty with biopsying post radiotherapy. Some people would say we'll do it at two years or three years, but I think, and I think, you know, it's good to have those results, but the MR shows nothing and the PSA is looking really good. He's yep. 72, it's not like he's 50. So yeah, I do the same and just monitor things. And, and I think one of the points I should really uh, reiterate with this particular guy, and it's the whole point of focal therapy, obviously, is he has no side effects, none. Uh, I remember actually asking this particular patient um, uh, how he was feeling after the treatment. And, and uh, this is like several months after the treatment, and he said, what treatment? And that, I mean, you know, if you want to strive for the ultimate result in a patient who's got prostate cancer is to kill the cancer without giving any side effects. And I think that's where focal therapy has a great opportunity, at least in future, once we collect the appropriate data, um, to at least provide that option. Um, now, it would be a good time just before we finish up, because I can see we've only got a few minutes left. Uh, we, we may or may not have time for the last case, but I do want to address a couple of these questions. We've got Roberto Miano from Rome, who's um, fired in a question uh, to Caroline. Uh, what is your follow-up after focal high food? Um, and what is uh, the success after it? Sure. So, uh, so in terms of the patient follow-up, it's a three-monthly PSA for the first uh, for the first year. MRI scan at a year. I'll only do an MRI earlier than that if the PSA hasn't gone down from the, the pre-treatment value. Um, and sometimes, more often than not, that's just a combination of infection or whatever. But I'd have a look then. And then after that, four to six monthly PSAs. So if it's a young guy. Um, you know, higher grade tumour, I really want to keep a close eye. But if the one year MRI is looking great, PSA is down at around, you know, third to a half or less of what it was previously, then six monthly PSAs. And I'd usually do another MRI or two, but not necessarily the next year. Um, and then set a PSA threshold at which they'll have another MRI after that. So uh, okay. I don't routinely do biopsies. Yeah, um, that was my next question. You've moved away from, from doing any follow-up biopsies. You're really just doing an image-based and PSA-based. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if the PSA is going up and I can't explain it from the MR, then definitely they'll they'll be encouraged to have a biopsy. Or obviously if there's something on the MR that needs looking at, there was a whole question about whether you should do a second HIFU without a biopsy in between. I much prefer a biopsy in between. The patients aren't always that keen, but I just like to have all the information. Because if there's been some grade inflation and they're younger, I would say, look, perhaps we should be moving to radical now. Um, yeah, that would be my, my take on it, but no routine biopsies. How about you, Sanal? Are you, are you, what's your follow-up kind of uh, protocol? Yeah, so in addition to the PSA kinetics and the MRI, and the follow-up biopsy were recommended within one year after the focal therapy using HIFU. However, uh, so in our experience, so follow-up biopsy, biopsy would be avoided in the patient uh, whose pilot category are less than three and the PSA density are less than 0.068 after focal therapy using HIFU. This is our uh, result. Yep, okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question, which is a, a more technical um, on the radiology side to you, Richard, is uh, one of the attendees has asked, um, did you say that Resolve DWI is inferior to EPI DWI? I don't actually know what that means, so you better explain. <laughs> they're, the, they're the two different types of uh, diffusion that uh, Siemens offers. Uh, it, I think the Resolve is not as good, yes. Uh, it's a bit more blurry, uh, and it's not quite as the not as quite as focal, focally abnormal as the uh, EPI-based diffusion. Yes. Okay. Uh, another uh, question coming in: Any is there any appreciable difference between endorectal coil in a 1.5 Tesla MRI versus a body coil in 3T? Uh, Satoru, do you? I know you said that you don't use an endorectal coil, but did you no. used to um, with the 1.5 Tesla? Yes, I used. Uh, we used to use a, a 1.5 Tesla with endorectal coil, but we completely avoid the endorectal coil. First of all, it's very really, uh, expensive and time consuming. And uh, regarding the, well, for the detection of the MR, prostate cancer, 1.5 Tesla using a body core is basically sufficient because in Japan, the MR scanner is widely available. So we can easily repeat the MR scan if you have some any questions. So uh, the access to the MR scanner is quite, uh, quite open in Japan. So I think the end of the, uh, 1.5 Tesla with perfect, uh, Face core, face sub, uh, surface coil is sufficient for the most of the patients. And of course, a switch so uh, without uh, and the core is also very nice images, as we have already seen the nice images on from these institutions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if if people are happy to hang around for another five minutes, perhaps given that we've all got you here, um, why don't we just whiz through this last case because uh, it's all prepared and ready to go. Richard, are you happy to just? Uh, whip up the final case for, t for uh, this session. Really, because MRI got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to, yeah, we've got to, uh, you know, report the, uh, the positives and the, and the negatives of, of this whole um, game. So this is a 62-year-old guy, um, again, pretty high PSA, 8.4. Um, he had an MRI done a, a few years ago, which was initially reported as negative, as you mentioned. But again, his PSA density was a little bit on the high side at 19%. Anyway, let's have a look at this MRI first. So again, this is the, uh, uh, the routine way we set up. Uh, it's a prostate volume of 45 cc. Uh, the, trans the, the most important thing noted on the axial T2s is the peripheral zones near ISO intense with the transition zone. So that's already uh, gonna make our life a bit harder. But there's no obvious lesion on the T2s in either transition zone or the peripheral zone. Uh, in the high B value diffusion weight imaging, you can see it's diffusely slightly bright, but not focally bright throughout the, throughout the peripheral zone. And the same in the axials. Uh, axial the ADC, slightly dark throughout the peripheral zone, but bilateral and symmetric. Uh, and the same on the sagittal high B value here bright on one side and bright on the other. The, a, the DCE shows that homogeneous enhancement throughout, and this is the subtracted image, no focal lesion. Yep. So I would call that a pyrates too. Yep. 
Now, I mentioned before, this guy's got a, a PSA density that's uh, a little bit on the high side at 19%. Um, with a, a decent uh, PSA total itself at 8.4. So even though the MRI was negative, I actually went ahead and did a transparent biopsy. And he had positive cores right mid, left posterior, right anterior and left posterior up to four millimetres with small percentage pattern four. So Richard, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to the MRI in, in more specifically in a minute, but you can see that there's, there's very little pattern four but there is pattern four and it's in multiple places around the prostate. Do you want to comment on, on that in relation to the MRI appearance? Yeah, no, even seeing that, I still can't see it on the MRI. I think this is a false negative MRI. Yeah, in other words, you know, we do see so-called clinically significant cancers, um, which are simply not visible uh, on the MRI. Um, Caroline, this is a, a field that you uh, have heaps of experience in as well, in terms of the actual biology of mm. these types of cancers, if they're even if they are grade group two or at least three plus four, but they're not visible on an MRI, um, can you say anything about what you think how these types of cancers behave? Uh, yeah, so we've got um, we've got some really nice work actually showing that non-visible three plus four is less problematic than visible three plus four. Yep. So in terms of a surveillance treatment decision for this guy. I'd say he's suitable for surveillance. We might end up doing a biopsy at three years or biopsy if the MMR, if the, uh, if the PSA is going up because we can't rely on the MR to follow him. Although we do actually have people who started out with this sort of picture and then develop a lesion over time. And so sort of become suitable for focal or for, or for radical treatment. Um, I can't remember how old you said he was. 62, this guy. Okay, so so yeah, so yeah, if he wanted to, it's low volume pattern for non visible, and we know that the non visibility confers an advantage for him, so he could have surveillance if he wanted. If not, he'd be looking at radical treatment. Yeah, so that, that was almost exactly my thinking. And what I thought to try and tie break that situation was uh, get some extra imaging. Uh, so I actually ended up getting a PSMA PET for not your typical indication. And again, uh, we don't, this is not some evidence based per se, um, but um, I did want to get more information on this guy because I just wasn't quite sure which way to go um, from those two options that, that, uh, that you mentioned. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen and show you what my, uh, where's that gone? Whoops. Here we go. Uh, and I'll show you what the PSMA PET showed, if I can just get that enlarged again. Around. Okay, here we go. So, interestingly, um, what we couldn't see on the MRI, um, but what the biopsy uh, was telling us as well, is that right around the back of the prostate there in the peripheral zone bilaterally um, there was certainly avidity there i uh, don't actually have the suv max values um, for this psma pet but it's pretty clear based on those two shots uh, one just a psma pet obviously and then psma pet ct uh, that there is visible tumor and really because uh, there was uh, it was there was a lot of equipoise really in terms of whether we uh, do active surveillance or uh, radical treatment on this guy uh, after discussing and, and viewing that, that image, we did decide to go ahead and do a, um, a prostatectomy. So Andrew, you should have that there. Yep. Um, so he's got a lesion or his index lesion in the orange is, is in the right um, apical to mid peripheral zone, but he also has smaller lesions, uh, lower grade lesions in the left peripheral zone as well. Um, on low power, these localized lesion uh, pattern three and pattern four, I think it ended up being a quite twenty percent um, greater as twenty percent on the right hand side organ, all of the foci organ confined and and clear of margins. So I guess even now with that pathology, Caroline, you, you might say, well, he still could have had surveillance at least for a while because mm -hmm. there's pretty pretty low percentage pattern four there. Yeah. Yeah, I think he could, but at the same time, you know, he can be glad he's got his treatment out of the way, really unlikely to come back. So, you know, and he starts his recovery at a younger age than if he has it when he's 70. So, you know, it's uh, not a bad option. 
Any comments on, um, in terms of the primary tumour detection on MRI versus PSMA PET? Caroline. Yeah, that's interesting. So we don't have, so we use, I use PSMA PET when I, we've got a high grade tumour and we're doing it as a staging thing. So on the whole, I don't use PSMA PET to look sort of in the prostate. Um, we find, and I don't know whether you do too, a particular problem with the PSMA PET calling seminal vesicles positive. So we end up doing quite a lot of seminal vesicle biopsies that look fine on MR and actually we're fine. So, but it's interesting that it showed up. And we do have the odd patient where for some reason they have had a PSMA PET. We have a big PET center, so people have things for other reasons. Something shows up on a PET and then they come to us and get a PSA. Um, and I'm sure there are some that will be positive on PETs, that, you know, like this, but not really on MR. But we, I don't have a huge amount of patients in that just because of our pathway rather than anything else. Yeah, yeah, interesting. We have published, we have published on this. Yeah, we have. Uh, and uh, they are really, a comp they're really complementary. They, and if you pick high grade cancer, that they're, they're both good. <laughs> uh, and if you pick high grade cancer, Gleason grade group three and above, if you put the two of them together, they'll get about over ninety five percent. But there's some that are positive on MR that you don't see on PET, and vice versa. So. Mm -hmm. And we, so it, for us, it's really a complementary examination for intraprostate disease rather than one is always better than the other. Yep, yep, agree. Yep. And funnily enough, if we have an MR incompatible young person with, you know, a, a pacemaker or whatever, then we'll get them a PSMA PET first line. But in the UK, yep. that's seen as heresy. <laughs> we do, you know, we're able to do that. So we do do that when needed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, we, no. Have, we have people with bilateral toe hip replacements, which is, particularly as an older hip replacement, uh, then we, they would go straight to PET too because we're going to, we're going to really struggle. Yeah, or, or other, or other uh, contraindications to MRI, you know, like pacemakers and, uh, and, and uh, defibrillators and, and so forth, don't you think, Richard? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's, inter it's really interesting how there's this sort of natural evolution of, of expansion of indication for PSMA PET. The more you use it, the more, the more you think, oh, hang on, that might be quite useful there. So that's what, that's what we've been finding. Now, I'm, I'm aware of the time is ticking and also, Caroline, being on holidays. So it's time, I think, to, to wind up. Um, just to finish, uh, I would like to thank very much all of our expert panellists from around the world, uh, London, Tokyo, Osaka, and of course, our homegrown panellists uh, who are always uh, on this session, Andrew, Ryan and Richard O'Sullivan. So thanks again, Caroline. So now and Satoru uh, for joining us for this session. It's greatly appreciated. Always fascinating to hear what people are doing in other parts of the world. Um, obviously, there's evidence, there's clinical guidelines, and then there's real life practice. So uh, I think you know there's there's real value in uh, having these discussions. So thank you very much, all of you. Um, for anyone who's been attending, uh, again, don't forget that this is recorded, and we will put it up on the website in the next couple of days, so that uh, you can let your colleagues know that you can. Have a look at it. You can even speed us up if, if you think we're going a little bit too slow. Um, and so that's quite handy as well. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. And um, Thank you, Richard. Oh, oh, thank you, Jeremy. Right. No worries. <laughs> thank all right. you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. All the best.